let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. Welcome. Our guest today is Iris Nelson. Iris has an undergraduate degree in history and a master's in library science. She was a reference librarian in charge of the local history collection at the Quincy Public Library until her retirement. She has researched and written numerous articles, several centered on 19th century women, including contributions to the Journal of Illinois History. Currently, she is a board member of the Historical Society of Quincy and Adams County, and the Lincoln-Douglas Debate Interpretive Center, which focuses on the October 1858 Quincy debate and the Lincoln legacy. In recent years, her research has centered on Lincoln's many ties to Quincy, including our topic of discussion today, Colonel George V. Rutherford and his involvement guarding the Peterson House after President Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth at Ford's Theater. Welcome, Iris. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, this is a, a really interesting topic, and I think when when people hear about this story, they're going to be amazed at that connection to Quincy. I think so. It's a remarkable account, an eyewitness account to history on the evening of April 14th. And uh, George Rutherford was there in a timely manner. We don't know exactly how it is, that, where he was to learn of the shot so quickly. But within moments of hearing about it, uh, he went on to inform others, and we're going to be talking about that. But he lived in Quincy for many years. He had a farm out north of Quincy of about 80 to 100 acres. And uh, it seems that he had horses that were actually show horses. Right, I heard about that, yes. Yeah, yeah. And he also lived with his brother Reuben, who was uh, a doctor, a physiologist. And uh, Reuben also was very worked very much with um, land grants for universities. So he may have had a connection with Lincoln through Lincoln's interest in land grants for colleges and education. Right, right. And he also had a brother whose name was Friend, who lived in Alton. And Friend was a very close friend of Orville Browning's. So um, he lived here and, and farmed. And, you know, the question to myself was, how was it that he got this appointment to be assistant quartermaster uh, in Washington? Well, I think he got that in 1863, if I'm not That's mistaken. Correct, yes. So he had been in the war for over a year at that mm-hmm. point. And you're right. He must have had some connections or his family must have had some connections to make that ty- right. get that type of position. And there are two ways that I speculate about that. And one is through Orville Browning, who, of course, was there as a senator after Senator Douglas had died. And also um, his land out north of Quincy was right next to the Streeter family's farm. That's right. And so Ann Streeter became John Wood's uh, first wife. And, you know, John Wood, of course, was quartermaster That's right. uh, of Illinois. So there's every reason to think that those two connections had something to do that, with the fact that he was appointed um, to this position in Washington. Yeah, I agree. Iris, it's tradition here to accompany our conversation with a special brew. (laughs) I understand. (laughs) Our selection today is Newcastle Brown Ale, originally produced in Newcastle upon Tyne in England. It was created in 1927 by Colonel Jim Porter. He was a veteran of the First World War, and since George Rutherford was a colonel during most of our discussion today, I found a beer that had a connection to another Army colonel. Okay, Good job. That's as best I can do today Mm -hmm. with Newcastle. Mm -hmm. Uh, The beer is known for its famous five-point blue star, which represents the five founding breweries of Newcastle. Today, interestingly enough, it is brewed by Heineken's American Lagunitas Brewing Company in California and has been reimagined as a craft beer. The Smooth Brown Ale is available at Hy-Vee Wine and Spirits in Quincy. Remember, you can suggest a feature beer for a future episode just subscribe to the History of Go-Go podcast wherever you get your podcast and leave a comment. If your beer is selected, you will receive a $10 gift card from Hy-Vee. So 
please subscribe, like the Facebook page, and leave a comment. So you did a really excellent job of describing uh, Colonel Rutherford, Rutherford in the beginning. But on that night, let's set the stage for what happens that night. Mm-hmm. Um, what happens when President Lincoln goes off to the theater and he thinks he's going to enjoy just a, an, an average uh, evening Finally, the war is over. He's probably in a very festive mood. Um, And then what happens? Well, he had, um, just to go back into the day, he had a cabinet meeting that um, late morning. And it was a specially extended meeting in which he talked about, you know, the plans for the South and so on, was in a very jubilant mood as they all were. And he um, wasn't going to go to the theater at first, but General Grant was going to go. And then he had to, I think, leave uh, Washington. So he, um, you know, called a couple other people and they couldn't go. So it was uh, Claire Harris, I think, and uh, Henry Rathbone, uh, who they'd never met, who went with them uh, in the carriage uh, to the theater. So, you know, they enjoyed Our American Cousin until about the third act and in a couple scenes into it. Um, Lincoln loved farcical, satirical material. Which that definitely was. Yes. And he was a huge fan of Petroleum Nasby, who was um, a very popular satirist. Uh, His real name was Locke, David Locke. And David Locke, as a reporter had been at the 1858 Quincy debate here in Quincy to hear Lincoln for the first time. Now, that's a sidebar, but another very interesting story, uh, which we won't go into today. So he was, um, Rutherford, you know, was at somewhere in the vicinity, knew immediately about the shots, and um, he went to the telegraph office to uh, inform, I think it was Eckhart who was in charge of the, military telegraph and he wanted you know him to get to the um you know the peterson house and so on immediately so that they could start uh you know communicating with people that they needed to including newspapers etc so um he did that and then he went to general meggs and then the two of them went to stanton's house because the fear was that Stanton uh, would be um, assassinated. He was a target also. as well. Yes. So just to set the stage, as you mentioned, it was our American cousin, uh, cousin mm-hmm. Ford's Theater. John Wilkes Booth enters the theater, which isn't that big of a deal because he was— He's it, there, He's yeah. there on a yeah. routine basis as mm-hmm. an actor. He makes his way down a very narrow hallway, which I think about that, and I always— um, think it would be so defensible to put up a couple of layers of protection. Well, there was they, one. And, and yes. ineffective. Ineffective, yes. And so they could have done that. I, I, You know, it just uh, boggles my mind. Obviously, today that wouldn't have happened. No. So he enters into the booth. Um, he fires. No one really know what's, knows what's going on, even inside where Lincoln is seated. Right. He said he's seated at a rocker and nobody, even P, uh, Mary sitting right next to him, nobody can, knows what's going on. And part of it was that um, Booth chose a point in the play right. where he knew there was going to be a lot of laughter. Right. Which, in other words, the shot would not be heard as easily and he could get away more quickly, uh, jump on the stage. And of course, he had a lot of hazards just getting to the stage with his spur and then falling and hurting himself, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So he f- he fires into the president. Um, he yells, sick Semper Tyrannus. Mm-hmm. He then stabs Major Rathbone mm-hmm. all, all the way to the bone. Yes. He then jumps, as you mentioned, his spur gets caught on the bunting, mm-hmm. kind of falls awkwardly st- to the stage, then raises the dagger in the air, which he had just stabbed Major Rathbone with, mm-hmm. and yells, um, like, the South will be revived or reborn or something of that nature. Something like that. And then he escapes. Right. And then it's from that point, takes a few seconds, even for people who witnessed this, to 
Realize what happened. Realize what happened. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, even people around are, are thinking, well, there's no guns in the Even the stagehands are thinking, like, what was that? There's no yeah. weapons that are fired during this play because that could have been yes. uh, replicated in a and, play. And that certainly wasn't the case. So it takes everybody by surprise, which allows Booth to actually escape. Horse is waiting for him. He gets on the horse and gallops off and then enter Colonel Rutherford after he gets the uh, yes. notification that the president has been shot and has right. eventually. Now, when the president is initially shot, there are a few doctors. There were soldiers actually in in mm-hmm. attendance mm-hmm. with weapons. And Rathbone, of course, uh, like I said, he didn't know Lincoln and yet he was the one who tried to protect Lincoln. And he suffered the rest of his life for the fact that he wasn't able to save the president. Uh, and that's a very fascinating story. But there has so been... So he, he has guilt because... Oh, he, huge guilt. I mean, psychologically he is, you know, it's PTSD of the day. You know, he was never, never the same. Um I, I believe that there had been a bodyguard who was given a note and had left the station, all of this being the plan, of course. And I've been to Ford's Theater. Maybe you have, too. You know how intimate it is. Yes. It's very, Seems very so small. so small. Yes, right. very small. And, you know, the little staircase that goes up to the booth right inside the door is, um, you know, it's just tiny. It's narrow. It's not very wide at all. Right. So all this is happening, um, and Rutherford is on his toes, and he just does what he has to do, which is to notify uh, the different generals that are over him and get the telegraph going, as I said. So he is at Stanton's house, and he is ordered to stay there until 1 o'clock and then to report to the Peterson house. So he goes at 1.30. He's in station at 1.30, um, but he goes you know, up to the room first, and, of course, the entire cabinet is there except Seward, who has been dreadfully um, injured and stabbed. And his house and his, you know, his son and others are just wounded. It's a bloody, bloody mess. So, all right, let's, because this is so interesting. Most people don't realize, a lot of people don't realize that, that it was a conspiracy that involved basically, not just the president, but the vice president, yes. Secretary of State Seward. Mm-hmm. And at Seward's house... There's a former Confederate um, named Lewis Powell. He had gone by different names, all kinds of different names. Mm-hmm. Lewis Payne is sometimes. But Lewis Powell arrives at uh, Secretary Seward's house, which was on Lafayette Square. Mm-hmm. And he knew that the secretary had been in a carriage accident, was yes. laid up in his house. In Ten days bedridden. before or something like that. And the other aspect of that is a carriage accident back then is like a car accident today. It's a mm-hmm. severe Situation and he was in very bad condition. Yes, he was mm-hmm. bedridden, almost immobile. Mm-hmm. Um, Powell knocks on the door. He gets confronted almost right away. He says he has medications. He's allowed in. He works his way up to the third floor where the secretary is at. His son Frederick Seward approaches the guy and says, "Like something's not quite right here." So he says, "The secretary is sleeping." Mm -hmm. And then I think the daughter, Fanny, says, well, he's up. He, he, you know, I just talked to him. He's awake. Well, there are different (laughs) accounts. And one is that uh, the man who answered the door said, no, I'll take it up to him. And then he eventually pushes his way in. No, I have to do it. Right. And and Fanny is in the room. I, I, you know, she's in the room, but, um, and she's there to spend the night with him because he had 24-hour, you know, watch more or less. And, um, and of course, he fights Fred off the stairs. Yeah, so, so initially, Fred figures something's completely yes, uh-huh. off here. Yeah. He confronts him. Powell turns as if he's leaving. And then he turns back around, points the revolver at Frederick Seward's temple. Exactly. Pulls the trigger. And it doesn't go doesn't off. Doesn't fire. Yeah. So then he bashes Frederick on top of the head so badly Mm -hmm. that his head is fractured, his skull is fractured Mm -hmm. to the point where you can see the brain. That's right. That's right. Now, that's That's a hard hit. That's a hard hit. And that's how. Now, the other thing about it is Lewis Powell's a huge man. That's another aspect of it. He's Mm -hmm. just a huge, physically imposing man. 
Frederick Seward then is completely disoriented because he's been knocked sure. really senseless and he takes a few steps. At that point, Powell enters Secretary Seward's room. Now, this is the mm-hmm. same night that Lincoln had just been shot. shot. Mm-hmm. So he enters Seward's room. There is an attendant there, uh, Private Robinson, mm-hmm. who had been given light duty. Now, this was light duty for Private Robinson, right? <laughs> um, helping the secretary. He confronts him. He gets stabbed. Right. He gets sliced in the forehead. Mm-hmm. So now there's bl- there's bl- there has to be blood everywhere. There is. He oh. jumps on the bed and starts stabbing at Secretary Seward, who really – and he keeps turning his head to try to get his jugular, but he has like a, an apparatus to protect his jaw because mm-hmm. of the accident. That saves him. And that saves that him. That saves him. So Seward then falls off of the bed. Robinson then grabs Powell. Then Augusta Seward wakes up. The whole household at this point is going, it's wondering mayhem. what's going on. Yeah. They wrestle around with him. They get him down. Um, Augustus Seward goes to get a weapon. Mm-hmm. That's when he forces his away, uh, himself away from Private Robinson, races down the stairs. There's a courier coming up the stairs. He stabs him in the back, mm-hmm. knocks him down the stairs, and he races out yelling, I'm mad, I'm mad. And that's the last they see of Lewis Powell for that night. For that night, yeah. Just a gruesome scene. Oh, I can't even imagine. See, sometimes yeah. we read a history book and we don't realize that's those are real cuts and well, there real was blood mayhem. in the entryway. Even I mean, there was just blood everywhere, and uh, it gets passed over in terms of the story of Lincoln's assassination. And you know, Seward's whole cheek was pulled down. Right, uh, he stabbed his cheek. Yes, and he'd already had issues with his jaw because right. of the accident. So mm-hmm. when they find him on the floor. They, first of all, they think he's dead. Mm-hmm. And then I think Stanton is the one when he when they arrive, if I'm not mistaken, and Robinson then comes to the private that had been there to attend him. They find out that he's not yeah. deceased, but his jaw is hanging off. Right. right. That's how gruesome and how ugly this scene is. And, you know, back at the time, they couldn't send him to the ER. So just doing it in-house without a medical professional person there at the time – they did the right thing. They, you know, they just sort of put it back and kept it wet, you know, moist. And um, it saved his life. You know, uh, if that jaw brace hadn't been there, it would have gotten the A. Jugular. Jugular. Right. You know, and he would have been gone, too. And, of course, then they wanted to get uh, Vice President Johnson. But, you know, he was at the Kirkwood Hotel. The Kirkwood House. So, um all of this investigation, they're in the infancy of investigation back then. They're trying their best. Oh, yes. The best investigators are not in D.C. at all. They're in New York. New York City. They came from New York as soon as they could, yeah. The Army's doing the best it can, but they're not really – they're not prepared to do the forensics and so forth that would have been necessary to track down this whole no. conspiracy. and Total chaos. It's total yeah. chaos. Yeah. So um, – but they know that Vice President Johnson is probably a target. So they go to the Kirkwood House. The individual that was sent to the Kirkwood House was George Atzerott, and he was a German immigrant. And he had rented a room in the Kirkwood House, mm-hmm. kind of loses his will. He doesn't make any attempt no, on Johnson's life. He said he wasn't hired to kill anyone. He, he was wasn't there even there at the time when they kidnapping, showed up. Kidnapping, and he, he went down to the bar and then left. I mean, he just couldn't handle, you know, killing someone. Right. So, but what they find is when they entered the Kirkwood house and they're investigating, they said, you know, we have a a shady character and they trace into his room. And when they, when they uh, do a little investigative work in the room, they find under his pillow, he has a weapon. Mm -hmm. There's a dagger underneath, I think the blankets, his jacket is hanging on the wall and in his jacket, there are a couple of books. One book is a map of the South. The other book is um, a bank book from the Bank of Ontario with the account holder being John Wilkes Booth. So they're autom- automatically making these connections. Sure. Because almost immediately, even in the chaos at Ford's Theater, certain individu- in- individuals had picked up that um, John Wilkes Booth was the 
the individual that had committed the... Oh, yes, because they all knew his... He was an actor there oftentimes, so they knew his face and they knew it had been him. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where um, that night was... Well, anytime there's vast confusion, nobody knows what someone else is doing and who's been informed, and that's what Rutherford was dealing with. He was going to all these places, but in a couple of cases, people had already been there. So he goes into the Peterson house, as he's supposed to, at one thirty. And he takes his place as the head of all the guards that are there. Um, and, of course, Lincoln is up on the up on the second floor, lying in the bed, um, like nine and a half by 17-foot room, something like that. Right. And it's very, very, very crowded, of course. Because everybody's Everybody, coming in. Yeah. In fact, it gets so chaotic that they have to get control of the room because there's too many people coming right, in. Right, and across the hall... Um, there is a room set up kind of like, a, you know, Telegraph. central. Yeah. yeah. And they're taking witness accounts, you know, getting them written down, uh, interviewing people and so on, sending telegraphs and uh, doing everything, you know, trying to make order of something so they can get these things done. So like they don't know uh, what's over yet. No, it's a vigil. It's and not, a vigil and not only the that, there's there's a fear that that the Confederate army had something to do with this. And now they're going to attack Washington. They, yes. there was so many, so much chaos that night. Well, they wouldn't know what direction to move, you know, where this is coming from. If it's, you know, a group of people only, or if it's a, a bigger, a issue. bigger, cons- much but, larger. Um, you know, I, th- I think I read somewhere that the plan for Booth was to take the head and the heart of, of the United States, you know, um, get Lincoln, the heart and and the head, meaning the Secretary of War, Secretary of State, uh, and the Vice President, those three people out of the picture. And uh, the, the, the thing, and obviously that night they thought that Stanton was a target as well. That seems very obvious to me that he would be a target. It's interesting that Booth didn't include him. Well, there was a rumor um, that Stanton was going to be at the theater that night, but I think he was asked, and he said, I mean, he just didn't like farcical-type plays, so he said no. Not in his character. (laughs) Not not at all. Not in his character. (laughs) Um, So he wasn't there, and and perhaps they might have expected him to be there. Um, We don't know that. So, you know, um, Rutherford is at the house, and, you know, everything is going on upstairs. You know, it's rainy outside. Um, so what's he do that night then? He gets there. It's very chaotic. Well, he's standing guard all night. He's standing guard all yes, night long. He's standing guard all night. And then at six o'clock, he, he goes to have something to eat and the other guards take over. So he comes back, um, shortly after, I think, short, I think it was about 10 minutes after Lincoln, Lincoln had died. died. And I think he died at seven twenty two. Uh-huh. And and at that point, he goes, um, well, let me back up just a second. Okay. While he's at dinner, uh, he sends a telegram to Quincy. He sends a telegram saying the president's been shot and he is just expiring. He hasn't expired, but he's expiring. Because that's and what they all anticipated at that time. Absolutely. Yeah. Everyone except Mary. Mary right. did not realize that he was dying, and they couldn't tell her. They didn't tell her, and then she was not happy that they hadn't told her, uh, understandably. But uh, so then when he comes back, um, the president has uh, died, and um, he stays then. He stays, you know, for uh, until, well, he's there through 9 o'clock, and at 9 o'clock um, the wooden coffin comes, to place his body in, and then Rutherford and several others escort the body uh, in the hearse to the White House. So according to Rutherford, Mm -hmm. when the president dies, Secretary Stanton um, asked him to do the, the, which would be a funerary ritual at the time to put coins on the president's eyes. Yes. Yes. I mean, this is one of those things that there are three other people who have claimed 
to have put the coins on Lincoln's eyes. You know, it's an old tradition um, that goes back to ancient times. You know, right. So, just to give people some context, so this goes back to ancient times, like Iris mentioned in Charon's Oval, and Charon was the the ferryman mm-hmm. who would ferry the dead across the river Styx, but he wouldn't do it for free. Right. So the the Greeks would leave an obol, which was a form of, it turned into a coin, but before that they just had metals and stuff, mm-hmm. and that's what they traded. But that's where the, the term obol comes from. But that was the way you got into the underworld. You needed you need a Charon's obol. You need that's right. to, to, that's get, right. to pay the, the ferryman. Yeah. Um, now in the Victorian time, that had continued, but for completely different reasons. Mm-hmm. In Victorian time, individuals would pass away and they would close their eyes gently. But over time, their eyes would open back up. Yes. And so they would place a coin on their eyes to keep them closed. Correct. Uh-huh. And not only that, and maybe you could speak to this a little bit, but at the time they would have wakes and bodies would be out for extended periods of time. Yes, as in family. the living room. Mm-hmm. And family would come Parlor. and the body would start to dehydrate and the eyes would sink into the head. I know it's kind of gross, but it's but, real. But it's real. And that was another reason for the coins. It would cover the eyes so the eye you wouldn't see the sunken eyes, which would kind of freak people out. Right. And Lincoln's uh, eyes were not completely closed when he died. Um so his eyes were closed and then um Rutherford was asked if he had coins, and he had a silver coin in his pocket that had been given to him by General Gerson, Benjamin Gerson, from Griggsville, uh, not too far away from here. And so he put a coin on, and then someone else gave him the second silver dollar. So he had two silver dollars on his uh, eyes. And um, so those the, and the reason for that is those silver half dollars were heavy enough to keep the eyes. Well, very. Closed. Yeah. Right. Much heavier than a penny, which is often used. Um, and the interesting thing about this, since there are three other people who claim to have done this, is that Rutherford had this documented by two other people who were in the room at the time. So, you know, he knew that this would be contested. So he had witnesses to it, and I wish that there was some access to those um, uh, written statements, so to speak. But there's every reason to believe that it was Rutherford who put the coins on Lincoln's eyes because— Well, the immediacy of it, too. He recorded it um, before he even slept. He had been up for 33 hours without any break except for food. And um, he didn't go to sleep before he wrote this entire account down. And I don't want to get ahead of things, but we know that because he, um, he wrote this letter and he mailed it to Quincy, to the newspaper. Now, he happened to come the same day that the letter got here. He okay. came home the same day the letter got here. But it is in then the paper here on April 24th. That's where I remember seeing it. Yes, yes. So the tel- the telegram seeing that Lincoln is just expiring, of course, came right away. And um, we know the play-by-play of everything he did that night because he delineates it so incredibly much in detail. So we're fortunate to have this amazing story that isn't recorded in any of the Lincoln histories. I read a fair number and I've never seen the story. And, you know, it's an important one for um, more to realize that this person who, you know, it's happenstance. He's time and place. He was there. He was on duty and that was his That's responsibility. Right. That's right. But he wrote it down and he wrote it down immediately. You know, so many people, you know, when you have memoirs and someone is going back 50 years or whatever, there's reason to doubt the memory. That's right. Yeah. Um, so this this account is very exclusive, and it really gave people in Quincy an eyewitness account of what you know Brotherford did that night, and what was um, happening. So when when he does that, and he and he follows the instruction of Secretary Stanton, mm-hmm. and he places the coins on Lincoln's eyes, then what happens to President Lincoln? 
Well, then at nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah, they, okay, you were um, mentioning. Yeah. Okay. The coffin um, comes and uh, they escort his body to the White House. And so Rutherford's course, still there. He's still with, there. He's still in charge. Um, and, and, he's, it was and he's raining accompanying terribly. The, and he's accompanying the president. He's accompanying the yes, body. his body, right? And he's taken into the front room on the second floor, I believe. And uh, the coffin is put on a couple chairs, and um, he stays there. I think until about noon, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's watching right. Watching the body, yeah. So. So he had been there the whole time, multiple hours. 33. 33 straight hours. 33 hours, hours. yes, yes. And um, what he did exactly after 12 o'clock, I mean, it doesn't say when he wrote all of this, but he could have had meetings with some of the, you know, the command people to sort of sum things up or whatever. But um, the other piece that's interesting about Lincoln's uh, body that day is that Orville Browning uh, was the only non-medical, non-military person that was there for the autopsy. Do you think that's because of Mary? Is that as a request from her, or do you think he's using his position to? I don't his think it's because of his position at all. I think it's because of the friendship, you know, the right. long, long-term friendship. Yeah. Right. Um, and I don't know that Mary would have been capable at that moment. Yeah, you're probably right. Of saying anything uh, to Orville. But, um, you know, he does write about it in his infamous diary <laughs> that we get a lot of information from. Yes. So this is a, an amazing story, but it really doesn't stop there because now there's an investigation. Mm-hmm. And they have to track down these individuals. Now, um Booth's journey takes him into Virginia and 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 so forth, and it's and it's a wild. Um, he takes him to Doctor Mudd's house, and mm-hmm. and it's a and it's a lengthy um, manhunt. Twelve days. Twelve days. Twelve days. Um, but he's not alone because they're still in. They have to search for George Atzerodt, mm-hmm. and really they know it's Booth, and so they start asking questions. Who are his associates, which leads them to John Surratt, which leads them to where John Surratt is staying, which is Mary Surratt. Mary Surratt. And now you have another connection. Yes. And the investigation eventually leads to Mary Surratt being arrested for her connection. Correct. In the assassination or the conspiracy. Mm -hmm. The interesting interesting thing about the day that they show up to arrest Mary Surratt, that's the day that Lewis Powell shows up at the Surratt house. At the exact same time. So they're sent out. There's a, um, a, a Major Henry Smith, and he's sent out to arrest Mary Surratt. He gets there, and Lewis Powell shows up with a shovel, 9 o'clock at night. And he says, I'm supposed to dig a, a ditch for Mrs. Surratt. And, they're, and the Major's like, at 9 o'clock at night? Something's, Something's amiss. Yeah. And so he, ini- he almost automatically... automatically thinks something's wrong with this character. So he puts him under arrest too. And then that's when he's implicated in the, in the Seward situation. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Mary Surratt's house was a boarding house was very, very close to Ford's theater. Yes. It's not far at all. Um, so it was, it's interesting that it was so close to Ford's theater and they didn't know from the time in early March where they were thinking about doing this, when and where um, the assassination would take place. But it was almost on the day of, of his second inauguration. Mm. And I know that originally the plan was, they had been planning for a long time at the Surratt House, but other places as well. Mm-hmm. And the initial plan was to just take the president captive. They knew that President Lincoln went back and forth to the soldier's home, which was a couple hours, I believe, from if I'm not mistaken, from the White House. Just three miles. Three miles. Three miles. Take them. By carriage, not that long. 30 minutes maybe. 30 minutes. Yeah. And they thought within that space of time, because many times, especially early on, Lincoln didn't have guards or anything. He no. wasn't accompanied by any cavalry. He would just go off on his own. And the thought was that would incapacitate the government. Mm-hmm. And not only that, 
After a while, General Grant had ended these prisoner exchanges because it wasn't benefiting the Union anymore sure. because they, were, they had the advantage. And the thought was, if we can capture Lincoln, we can get them to release all of the old Confederates or the Confederates who'd been imprisoned, imprisoned, imprisoned because of the war. Right. And that was, a, that was the plan. But, of course, then the war ends and that plan is altered. So that was another a- aspect of the conspiracy as well. But it takes 12 days, uh, and Booth is this crazy journey. He runs into some uh, Confederates going home from the war, and as we mentioned, uh, Dr. Dr. Mudd sets his leg. Yes. Um, and then he ends up in a tobacco barn. Mm-hmm. And in that tobacco barn, a, uh, I think it's a New York cavalry comes upon the farm. They find him in that tobacco barn with David Harold. David Harold had actually been part kind of helping out George Atcherot. He had helped out Lewis Powell. He had showed up at Secretary Seward's house the night with Powell, but he doesn't have the will to go in or anything like that. And then when the commotion hits, he takes off. I think Joan Savant was supposed to be there too at, at uh, Seward's house. Yeah, so um, so then they're, they surround the tobacco barn. And the tobacco barn would have slit, slits in it, so it was open. It wasn't the, – the wood wasn't – The air to get the air the in. The air to get, yeah. the, get mm-hmm. the air in. So they surround the tobacco barn, the cavalry unit does, and they're watching Booth and Harold in there, and they set fire to the tobacco barn to get them to get out. At that point, Harold, I think, uh, leaves. He, he gives up. But Booth decides – I'm going to go out like guns a blazing. So he's getting ready and there's soldiers around looking through these spacings in the tobacco barn. And there's a, a private named Boston Corbett and Boston Corbett sees this happen. And before Booth can run out and start firing, shoots him through the neck. He's paralyzed. They move, move him to the farmhouse that's there to the steps and he dies the next morning. Um, and that kind of concludes that part of it for Booth. But then there is a – the investigation continues. Several people are implicated. Not everyone gets the death penalty. No. But in these military tribunals, four individuals get the death penalty from that. Booth has already been uh, taken care of. But Mary Surratt gets the death penalty in the military tribunals. Uh, David Harold, George mm-hmm. Atzerott, and Lewis Powell. Right. Now, there's an interesting connection to Quincy to that trial as well. Yes, yes. Um, you know, Orville Browning was back in Washington after he lost his bid for the senatorship in uh, November of 1863. And um, the Lincolns did not want Browning to go back to Quincy. They wanted him in Washington because, um, he, like I said, he'd been a close friend for so many years Browning, even after he was senator, was at the White House all all the time. Um, I think we've made a count, and it's, you know, over over 100. And um, so he goes to work for this Thomas Ewing Jr., the law firm, and he ends up being defense counsel, you know, for Mary Surratt and for Arnold, I think, and who was the third one? I think there were um, three or four. That well, he, he, did. he specifically for Mary Surratt, he's asked to write the stay of execution. Yes. Um, because no woman had ever been executed in Never. the history of the United mm-hmm. States. And this and was it, going to be the very first woman. And so he has to do – that has to place him in an incredibly difficult position, being so close to the Lincolns and now as an attorney – to write this ex- stay of execution. Now, now, that's not to say she wasn't going to be punished. They just didn't think she should be executed. Is that correct? Well, it's, you know, the whole trial being a military trial was quite a different type of trial. And that's right. Of course, he thought it should be in a civil court, not a military court. You know, and that, that ties us to more modern times, and we've dealt with terrorists and so forth. Mm-hmm. And there's individuals who think, well, we we should because they're military combatants. We should try them in a a military court. Now, military tribunals, there there isn't a an appeal system, 
So whatever is determined is the final. Is it? Yeah. That's the final. Yeah. And so that's the difference between a civilian court. You get into the civilian court, then you get the entire appeals process, can, which can be appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. And that could lengthen out an entire case. Well, and, and Mary's part was never absolutely clear. Um, certainly by the fact that they met at her house, et cetera, and her son was involved, she too was condoning the situation. But um, Browning did write a writ of habeas corpus on the very morning, you know, that uh, she was uh, hung in a last ditch, uh, you know, attempt to save her life. Um, And it wasn't because she wasn't guilty of some aspect of this uh, conspiracy, but that, um, you know, it was about the civil court as opposed to a military court. Military tribunal. Yeah. Now, the last thing that he attempts to do is they appeal to Vice President, now President Johnson. Johnson. Mm -hmm. And he's just not having any of that. He's staying completely out of it. He's not dealing with it at all. And actually... Um, He was pretty broken up by the fact that Lincoln was killed. They said when they first told uh, Vice President Johnson of Lincoln's assassination, he wept. Um, But he's not having any – and I don't think he has the demeanor, uh, knowing uh, his history, to be very forgiving in that situation. (laughs) Well, I mean, you think of the change in positions that many in, in Lincoln's cabinet had, such as Stanton. And Seward, for that matter. I mean, they absolutely learned to respect and love Lincoln. And they wept openly, you know. I mean, Stanton delivered that famous line, now he belongs to the ages. Right. And um, even at the White House, you know, when the coffin first came, that's he what, knelt that's down. That's what Rutherford says. And, and Rutherford wept. tells yes. the story about yes, exactly. Stanton, after he'd been placed in the White House. Yeah like leans over basically resting on the coffin and yes. just and just weeps. Yes. Which doesn't seem to be in his character either, but he must have been so moved by it. I I think they were very very close and those on the inside knew the sense of respect that Stanton had gained for him because after all you had this guy from the west coming in as president who was just a bumpkin. What did he know? And that's what they thought initially. Yes. And, and um, Stanton had a run-in with Lincoln. This is kind of off topic, but I love this story about Lincoln. He's He gets involved, I believe, in a railroad case, and they want some country lawyer mm-hmm. um, to give appeal to the case. Lincoln shows up. Isn't and, that in Ohio? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and Cincinnati, I believe. Okay. And so he shows up. And Stanton basically just, they're eating dinner. They don't include him. Mm-hmm. They're completely dismissive of, of him. They're, they're above him. Yes. And he doesn't, whole, he doesn't take offense to that at all. He just shows up to work every day. They don't ask him to do anything, but he still shows up. Mm-hmm. I think he still gets paid. And he goes back to Illinois. And then years later, no grudges. It's such a, a strong political uh, lesson for any leader to follow that type of, he just doesn't hold any grudges. He may have them, but he doesn't outwardly show them, and it doesn't affect his relationships with those people later. It's such well, an important um, lesson to learn, maybe not even just for a politician, just anyone for anyone. Yes. And, of course, team of rivals. The word rival is exactly right for those he chose for his cabinet. And he knew he wanted to have people in opposition to him and his thinking, so that he was having a more balanced approach as, as much as he could be. He had his cause and his, you know, the great issue of slavery in the Union. But um, I think it's very admirable, obviously, that he um, could see that people from the other side were important to decision making. Oh, I agree. I agree 100 percent. That's true leadership. Um, and that's the important part of history is there's. It's kind of like a little bit of a playbook. People have done things in the past. You can refer to their actions. Wish they would consult those things. <laughs> consult those things. And you might may make better decisions. Yeah. Um, so back to Rutherford. He's a, he's around all of this. Yes. He, account, he takes an account of all of this, including Stanton weeping at the White House. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, that's just an amazing story for somebody right here from Quincy. Um, and not enough people know about it, as you mentioned. It's not no, mentioned enough. No, it's not mentioned. And I can see why in the sense that historians writing about the assassination and, um, you know, like Blood on the Moon, written by Steers, and also uh, Swanson's book, uh, 12 Days, I think, um, to find Booth. That's not the title, but the subject. And, um, you know, who would think to look in the Quincy, Illinois newspapers for uh, a piece of the story? But that's the beauty of, of research. That's the beauty of history, too. It is. But, it's you there. know, you've got to find the nuggets. You got it. And, and you have to go to where you don't expect them. Um, you know, that long shot. I mean, Quincy had so many question, uh, connections to Washington, to Lincoln, that in some ways I'm a little bit surprised because John Wood, you know, was here. He received uh, the news at the Quincy House. They went across the street to the uh, Congregational Church, I think it was, and uh, rang the bell, you know, when Lincoln died. Except John Wood didn't do it himself. There was a 14-year-old boy there named Eldridge Stone, and John Wood said, let him ring the bell. He'll remember it longer. And I think that's such a sweet um, generational thing to do. And that's what a lot of people don't know about the founder of, of the city, um, how rich his history is. That's, that's a discussion for a, another podcast, I think. Well, I think so, too. And, of course, that bell, which was rung for many different things in Quincy, but including uh, Lincoln's death, um, still hangs on the south side of the Historical Society. Yeah, the Twelfth John Wood and, Mansion. Dawson State, yeah, John Wood Mansion. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and then you have the connection with Browning, too. Um, all of that is just um, amazing. And right during that monumental time in our nation's history, um, what happens to Colonel Rutherford? He, he doesn't, he gets promoted to general, but then what happens to him after the war? Well, he comes home. Uh, in 1867, and goes back to the farm, basically. Um, he I think he up, gets a few positions, and, and this isn't uncommon. These these veterans, mm -hmm. um, Captain Pickett got, was one of the, uh, maybe the very first uh, postmaster, one of the early postmasters of the city. He was po appointed that by, um, not one of the first postmasters, but one of the most influential um, and other Civil War veterans get these these positions because of their connection with the Union Army, and many of them because of their connection with uh, Grant when he becomes president. Well, the patronage that was there when Lincoln went into office, of course, is a story in itself. You know, people asking for positions. Um, for example, Browning really wanted to be on the Supreme Court. And he didn't get that position, but he ended up, you know, after Douglas died, as I said, going in as a center, senator um, until the fall of 1863. But patronage was the way things were done, the way things are done, I guess. And so people who had positions were more or less rewarded. You know, Especially for the if work you they had, had served in the Civil War. Yes. That, that became almost essential to anything after that politically or like even at the presidential elections, it isn't until Grover Cleveland is the first president who hadn't served in the civil war, all the presidents from um, after Johnson all the way to um, Grover Cleveland had served in the it's, civil union well, uh, in the union army. Well, Grant is the person, per, a perfect example of course, of someone um, the general, you know, the successful general toward the uh, more like the end of the war um, certainly, well, you know, was grief stricken and never thought that he would even, you know, run for president at some point in his life. But because of his huge success and his popularity, he became that person. Um, I don't really know what Rutherford did after he came back except to be on the farm. He was very young when he died. He was 42 when he right. died. And he came back in 67, so it was only like five years later uh, that he died in California. But he was here in 1870, 
and in the census, he still yeah, he shows d- he up d- here. I think he dies in 72. Right, but he goes to California in 72, and he dies in August of 72, which it may be that he went there uh, because of some health issues and going to a warmer climate. That could be. Uh, because he was there for a matter of months. Right, not, he wasn't there that, that no, long at all. No, he leaves and, Quincy and he goes to it was it Napa County. Mm-hmm. Um I think he's in, is he in San Francisco or is he just outside Napa of San Francisco? would be further south, yeah. Okay. And then uh, he dies of consumption. Mm-hmm. So it, it he spends almost all of his life in Quincy, his, right. his adult life. Yeah, yeah. All right. So it's, um, it's one of the, you know, the few stories that um, uh, haven't been well known even locally. And, of course, you know, our mission is to make uh, – public history of those stories that are connected to Lincoln and people who lived here who were an amazing part of the unfolding story of Lincoln's life and the history of this country. And one more thing that I'd like to add is that we've all seen the photograph, not the photographs, excuse me, the depictions that were later done of those in the cabinet and others who were beside Lincoln Uh, when Lincoln was on his deathbed at the Peterson House. But there is one rendition that was done in 1965 um, by Alonzo Chappelle, C-H-A-P-P-E-L, who was uh, an artist who specialized in historical scenes. And in that one, Rutherford is depicted, and he is standing right next to Stanton on the far right, and I think to the left of um, the secretary. Or to the right, you know, and that and that of the secretary. That's in complete alignment with his story. Yes, that he would be next to Stanton. Yes, so it is. So that that's interesting. That's another interesting part of the Rutherford story. Well, and at the time, for this man to know that when he's doing this rendition, at some point after the assassination, uh, those key players that night must have been named so that he could do this particular depiction and. And uh, it's the only one we have that shows Rutherford there. So it helps uh, give credibility to the story if there is anyone who might doubt it, you know, for whatever historical reason. There's so much evidence that would show that he was he was there's there's no reason for him to uh, fabricate this. He's involved with too many other people. Correct. He has justification almost immediately because of his position. Mm hmm. Um, his connection with Megs, um, all of those things line up to just basically prove the veracity of his of his story or his claim. Well, I think so, and I think that you know when when I looked at all the facts in writing the article, um, it's it's just this little window that he provided. You know, it's those little nuggets, as I said before, and it's um, a primary source. How often do you get a primary source written on the day that something like this happens? Well, not only that, it it he's one of the very few that detail what happens to the president's body after they place it in the coffin. They move it to the White House. It's him and one other colonel, and that's it. Right. And they accompany uh, the president's body to the White House with the group that's there they put it on the chairs he's Uh one of the only ones that are even there so of that story you have to rely on his account account of it Uh because he's one of the only ones that are actually there now stanton was with the hearse as it as it went to the white house his carriage came into the procession so to speak because people of course were lined up you know um just in mourning as the as the carriage moved through to the white house um, so it's it's just a fantastic story, and uh, one we want to tell and give people a really rich account of what it was that happened that night from one person's uh, eye view. So, right, happy to do that. Thank you, Iris. I really appreciate it. I'd like to thank our guest today, Iris Nelson, for the amazing story of Colonel George V. Rutherford who later became a general. We can't, we don't want to demote That's him. That's true. We don't want to demote him. And his duties after President Lincoln was shot. I would also like to, if you would like to try the featured beer 
You can get it at Hy-Vee Wine and Spirits. The music was provided by the band Bones Fork, and it's available on iTunes, Spotify, nearly everywhere you get your music online. Remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. Like the Facebook page. Leave a comment for your chance to win a gift card from hy V. Join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go.